Hey, what's going on, guys? We've got a special guest here today. We have Jay Fairbrother. He's a serial entrepreneur, a coach, and a consultant with 30 plus years of experience in starting, scaling, and buying and selling seven figure businesses. He's helped hundreds of coaches scale their businesses as a coach, business advisor, and turnaround consultant. He's a licensed sales coach and a peer group facilitator. Jay is also an executive VP of chapters for Global Leaders Organization, GLO for short. And his job is to recruit chairs to start new chapters all over the world. Jay's story includes losing everything in 2010 financial crisis and rising from the ashes. With the Profit Architects and Glow, he has fulfilled his dream of spending every day hanging out with that, hanging out with and helping entrepreneurs scale their companies and become better leaders. Jay, how are we doing today? Hey, Excited Jordan. to have you on. Thanks. Happy to be here. Yeah. So where does your story start? Where does all this start? <laughs> um, well, that's a long time ago. Uh, so about you know 30 some years ago, I left my cushy uh, job with benefits and started my first company, <laughs> which was a, a fundraising business. And, you know, my journey was very similar to most entrepreneurs uh, that, that I've ever met um, in that when you start a company, it's all about growth, right? It's more leads, more clients, more revenue. And then the next thing you know, you've got more problems, more headaches, more overhead. So in my case, for instance, my first company, I grew it to 50 employees. You know, my ego was was pretty good at that <laughs> point. I grew it to 5 million in sales. I kind of had some swagger, uh, but I really wasn't making any money to speak of. I was, you know, bare, at 5 million in sales, I was just barely making six figures. I hadn't had a vacation in five years. Um, you know, the business was running me. And that's a very typical entrepreneur journey that, that most end up in that I call the growth rut. Um, and, you know, fortunately, I figured some things out. And by the time I hit 200 employees, we were very profitable and I sold that business uh, a few years later. Incredible. So, yeah, that's kind of my start. Um, you know, I, I was very successful with my first business. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you mentioned that in the intro, or I've had, you know, the Profit Architects, my current coaching company is my ninth business. So it's not too difficult to do that math and figure out that while I've had some decent success, I've also had some massive failures. So, <laughs> yeah, but we got to learn from the failures and the success allows us to continue on. So it keeps yeah, going. I, I always tell entrepreneurs that, you know, if you're looking to hire ever a business coach or business advisor, doesn't have to be me, but make sure you hire one who has failed as, as you know, at least maybe not as much as they succeeded, but you've got to have those failures. You learn so much more from that than uh, actually your successes. Absolutely. So you end up selling this first business. Incredible. Congrats. And then where does that take you? Because most people would end up, were you hanging out on an island? Were you just relaxing? Was it over? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so during the 12 years that I built that business, I actually had a couple other businesses on the side that I started. <laughs> so I kind of got that entrepreneurial bug uh, pretty early on. Um, and, and, you know, have always been a serial entrepreneur, typically with more than one business going at a time. Um, so after I sold that first company, uh, I did take a year off. I just played, I studied the stock market. I, um, you know, just started making investments. Uh, and then I got bored and I bought a couple of businesses and, um, I, yeah, so I, I did many things. I, I did some consulting as well. Uh, during that time. Um, and then, you know, it was, you know, a few years later when the 2008 financial crisis began, and that was kind of a slow trickle for me over the next few years. And basically, at the end of it, I lost everything. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So I, you know, without exaggeration, went from being a multimillionaire living in a mansion to living in my friend's basement and didn't even own a car. 
I mean, complete and total wipeout. Um, and, you know, now I just say like, okay, I might be a decent entrepreneur, but I'm a really shitty investor. <laughs> <laughs> how does that, so I think to the, like, how does that happen? Like, cause I mean, were you over leveraged? Did you put in like too many different investment? Like, what was it? Because like right now, as we're recording this, times are very uncertain. Like this week, crypto has been down, stocks have been down, real estate's high, interest rates keep going up. And like, I'm not saying like, tell us what to do, but it's more like from your experience, what did you, what would you have done differently? What would you have had more cash? Like, yeah. what was the situation? So, it, it, you know, it was a, it was a combination of factors that, you know, I mean, look, I'm not the only one that lost everything in that period. Oh, no, it was, it was very scary for many people. Yeah. People lost jobs. People lost a lot of people lost a lot. Right. Um, but I think cause you're um, open about it and uh, share willing to share. It's just, there's so much value that can be extracted from that. Yeah. So, you know, I thought I was fairly well diversified. I, I'm sure a conservative investor would have looked at what I was doing and going, you're nuts. You know, this, this is, <laughs> but in my yeah. mind, you know, I knew I had a couple of risky plays, like, a, you know, there was a, an, a singular uh, natural gas well uh, that I invested in, um, uh, you know, and then I had a consortium of natural gas wells, you know, the, this was at a time when the the guys that I invested with in that partnership were driving Lamborghinis because natural gas had oh, just wow. been killing it, you know, uh, for years. And, you know, again, no one saw that natural gas was going to dive as a result of, you know, what was happening in 2008 with the real estate bubble yeah. and the stock market and stuff. You know, no one even saw that part coming. So it was things like that. Um, you know, I, I did have some business investments. I had, uh, you know, a bunch of money in the stock market. Um, and it was just like, uh, it, like I, the the thing, unlike what's happening now, where you know, with uh, like crypto, that you know, it, yeah. it could disappear overnight. This was more a, like watching a very slow toilet bowl drain, it, and <sighs> and it was you know, you could I I could see it happening, but there was nothing I could do about it. And because of other things that were happening at my in my life at that time, like in instead of you know, if, if people had just left their money in the stock market, then, you know, now everything would be great. Um, yeah. But I wasn't able to do that. So as the stock market's crashing, I'm having to pull money out to fund other things that are crashing, you know, to oh take money out. And, yeah. So, you know, to do uh, capital calls on these natural gas wells, you know, which it, it, it was just you know, it's just this confluence of events that, um, that just over time just took me down. Yeah. Wow. It's just, it, cause I mean, every year and everything happens, but people want to build up and become stronger and more resilient in whatever way. But what do you think from that you learned like, what, like this time around and like next time? Um, you know, it's funny because I, I'm not sure how much I would have done differently. I, I mean, you could argue that I could have, you know, put my money in a safe stock market conservative place, but that's just not my personality. You know, yeah. I, I'm just not the type of personality to just kind of sit there and watch, you know, my money grow at 8% or 9% yeah. or whatever. <laughs> um, so you know, like I said, some of the things I did were, were risky. Um, you know, I, I, one you know, lesson for sure uh, is that I'll never have a partner again. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I did at that time was I basically bought uh, this ultra luxury travel company um, where we did crazy trips, um, you know, with yeah. uh, renting, you know, private villas on private islands and castles in Europe and flying oh, wow. in chefs from all over the world and flying in butlers from England and, you know, uh, police escorted limo rides and, and those kinds of things. It was a lot of fun. Um, but 
I had a partner in the business who, you know, basically screwed me and, um, and I lost a huge sum of money, uh, you know, over a few years in that investment. Um, so don't go, be very careful about getting in bed with somebody partner? as a partner. It's one thing if you're bootstrapping and starting with nothing. Um, yeah. but, but, you know, like what I've learned about marriage is get a prenup, uh, for any business <laughs> partnership that, that you form, because tr- truly, that's the pain point with partnerships is when things don't go well and you're trying to break them up and dissolve them. Um, so yeah, in my case, one of my lessons, no more partners. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, cause when you start to think about it, it's like the, the investments, some, some of them need money to keep going on. Like when you own a business, you need to keep financing it or it goes bankrupt. Where if it was like a real estate and commercial real estate group, it's like they're not going to come ask you for more money. Like they might ask you for another investment. It's just different. Yeah. Well, actually, that did happen to me. I I had uh, a, a condo investment in Florida that um, <laughs> you know was in the process of being built, and when everything started crashing. They they, were asking you for more? they did a capital call um, to to you know uh, finish the Support. project or, or else you know walk away and I, I couldn't do the capital call it was excruciating. Oh. See, this is this is learning for me because I sit here and I just assume I'm like, well, that's just how the process works. That's what it is. Like, but when you've seen a lot more and you understand a lot more, you get to this point of, wow, there's a lot we can do differently. Like there's ways to protect yourself and there's ways to grow. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. So you end up going through all this. And then when did you realize that you're like, I'm, I'm, I got, I got to do a restart. <laughs> I, I gotta, I gotta pull this together. Cause I feel like it's a, it can be a very scaring and trying time. Like, you know what I mean? It's not, it was not yeah. a fun time. Um, so, you know, I, th- this part that I'm about to share, I'm not real proud of, uh, but it took me a long time. Um, I, I spent a number of years in what I call the seller of shame. And I really withdrew from the uh, most of the entrepreneurial contacts and net connections and network that I had built for 20 some years. I just withdrew um, because I was ashamed. I was um you know, did I didn't have the money to play with them like I used to, you know, to just not worry about it and drop a few hundred bucks gone out uh, for a night. Um, and so it was a very difficult period for me. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I wish that I could say, oh, yeah, I bounced right back and, you know, brushed it off my shoulder and, and went on. Um, I, I probably still have PTSD issues from that whole experience. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I, I, at some point, it was actually years later um, when something personal happened that really even put me in, believe it or not, a lower place than, than that whole thing. Um, and, and I really, you know, was struggling with, you know, what, what, what do I grasp on to here to, yeah. to keep going? Yeah. Um, and, at the, and at this point, my kids are grown and successful. So, you know, uh, um, it's not like I can, you know, if you had little kids, you can always <laughs> go there and say, you know, I need to be. Yeah. You know. So but, but what I grabbed onto, and it wasn't some, you know, big, bright, shining light in the sky. Um, but I just came back to, you know, I, I just got to get back to hanging out with and helping entrepreneurs. Uh, and that was that was the epiphany, right? It, it was no more detailed than that. I just need to get back to hanging out with and helping entrepreneurs um, because that's the core of who I built my identity around, and it's also what I'm good at. Um, yeah, I, I've you know been in entrepreneurial organizations. We're going to talk about Glow in a minute, but um, I've been in those kinds of entrepreneurial organizations for twenty some years, and been in peer groups uh, with with the you know groups of nine to ten entrepreneurs every month for twenty five years. Multiple of those peer groups, and you know I, that's really where I shine uh, is is being able to help other entrepreneurs um, look at issues in different ways, identify things that that they can, you know, strategic ways that they can change uh, their business and yeah. help scale it. Um, 
so at any rate, long answer to the question, but um, it took a while. And, and then, you know, after I had that, I just got to get back to doing this. That's when, you know, I finally kind of rehung my shingle uh, as the pro profit architects uh, and, and, you know, to get back in full time into the business coaching and business advising. Wow. The, it was really fascinating what you said regarding you had a group of friends you had because everyone's like oh I, if, even if i go to zero i still have my network and my network can help me and my network can bring me back but you have to be open to that point of hey i'm here and I, my pants are down like there's nothing i can do like i i want like i need help like you know what i mean and like no one ever talks about that part. It's all like, oh, you have a network, like you're fine, like they'll help you, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, no, when you're actually like struggling, no one brings that up. So I appreciate the, the vulnerability yeah. there. Well, it's especially hard for entrepreneurs. Um, you know, oh yeah. Our, when our everyone e handles everything. Yeah. Our egos are usually pretty large. Uh, we're type A personalities. We don't like anyone telling us what to do or when to do it. Um, and so, yeah, asking for help as an entrepreneur is, can be very difficult. And, and in my case, I'm fortunate because of those uh, organizations that I was involved with and those peer groups is that I, I learned that, you know, you can ask for help. And, you know, thank God I had that, uh, the, that peer group at that time and, and that network um, because, you know, the guy's basement I lived in for five months was, you know, one of, in one of those peer groups that, that I, you know, knew this guy for 15 years hanging out together every month wow yeah there, there's such a power in uh when you say peer groups masterminds all of that dynamic in which case people come together they're not part of the same business but they have business connotations but it could be around anything but it allows you to get different perspectives on different groups that's why people set up boards that's why people do a lot of different stuff yeah. it allows you to see it from different angles yeah well, you hit on something there too, that, you know, uh, there, while there's value in, in like an industry mastermind where everybody's in the same industry, to me, there's much more power in just the opposite. Um, you know, I, I remember my first peer group I ever got in, the first meeting I went to, um, you know, I, first of all, I left that meeting going, oh my God, I found my tribe. Like it was finally, I met some people that I can actually talk to and understand what I'm going through every day. Um, but there was a guy, I was in the fundraising business. There was a guy in my group who was in the concrete business. And, you know, I, I left that meeting thinking, you know, well, this is, this is a bit mismatch, you know what I mean? Like our businesses are so just polar opposite, different that, you know, I don't think I'll ever learn anything from him and he probably won't learn anything from me. But when you're, once you're in these groups for a while, um, and, and what we're working with and helping entrepreneurs, you start to realize that we all have the same problems. We have people problems, we have cash flow problems, we have sales and marketing problems, we have process problems. Those are universal to every entrepreneur, regardless of your industry size, um, the scope of your business. And that's one of the powers of being in these peer groups is to be in a room with other entrepreneurs who are gonna think completely outside of your box. And, and challenge you in ways that if you were just sitting in a room with people in your industry, even you know, non-competitive people in the industry, most of the time that industry think it, it's all along the same lines. It's like, how do we copy what others are doing in the industry instead of, well, you know, why don't you look at it like this or, you know, this way, which is not something you ever would have thought of. Yeah, exactly. Because it's completely out of left field. And but they're so used to it in their space that they handle it that way. And I think you brought up something super powerful is that if you don't have one of these peer groups, you should probably go look for one. And it doesn't even have to be in like, even if you have a regular job, like no matter what you do to get outside perspectives on what you're doing from actual viable people. And by viable people, I mean like everyone's a viable person, but like someone who's been there, done that before, it gives you a perspective of, wow it, it really opens your eyes to the opportunity that there is yeah so when i when i make that comment i found my tribe i mean you know entrepreneurism is a lonely business um because you know your friends who aren't entrepreneurs don't really get the, the pressure yeah. and what you're going through 
Um, you can't really talk to your family, even, even your significant other. I mean, you can't really come home to your significant other and, you know, hi, honey, how was your day? Well, if we don't, you know, find some money here in the next two weeks, I'm not going to meet payroll and the whole thing's going to come crashing down. That's not a conversation you're typically having with your significant other because you don't want to pass on that fear. You don't want to burden. Yeah, you don't want to yeah, burden the stress. Exactly. Right. So, um, you know, finding that group of other entrepreneurs is critical. And I will say one thing, not, not all masterminds are equal. Um, you need a very good facilitator and you need very good structure. Um, I've seen cases of masterminds and I've talked to people who have been in some masterminds that are, you know, just kind of loose that, you know, sometimes they end up just being like, you know, you're sitting around bullshitting about business and having cocktails. That's not a, that's not a true mastermind. I mean, you know, what should happen in these meetings is they should be very structured. The, the um, you know, the ones that, that we have always used and, and using glow um, are, you know, there's protocols, um, their, their structure and your sole purpose is there to help each other grow each other's businesses and become better entrepreneurs. Um, so it's not a social club. It's not a networking yeah. thing. It's not about, Hey, you got any leads for me today? Um, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's uh, very, very different. And the, the thing I think that, um, you brought up earlier is like, how can we all connect? It's because that emotional rapport, like from going to the group multiple, multiple times, everyone knows each other and everyone feels comfortable with each other. And even more importantly, everyone trusts each other. If everyone trusts each other, then it comes to the space of, oh, dude, maybe you can introduce me to this guy or, or maybe I can help you with your business here. Or I can do this or whatever it is. Right. That trust is built up enough to the point of, oh, Jay, like I've known Jay for 15 years. Like, come on, like, who cares? Like. You know what I mean? It, and no one thinks about it in that way, but it's like you're doing deposits into this group each and every week you go. So it Absolutely. makes a stronger and stronger connection. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of the people I've been in those peer groups with are, you know, my longest lifelong friends at this point. Um, and trust is absolutely critical as is confidentiality. Um, and what happens over time, it, it, I mean, you, you, described it actually very well and accurately is that there's a lot of business that ends up being done, but it's not, you know, the kind of, it's not from, uh, you know, Hey, I'm look, I need more business. Can you help me kind of thing? It's, you know, it's, it happens organically. Um, so yeah, the peer groups like that, if they're well run, um, you know, I, I would trade them in for all the books, courses, <laughs> videos, conferences, you know, all, all the business stuff you can absorb. Otherwise, get in a peer group and, and it'll change your life. Absolutely. So let's dive into it. What did, um, so you're down and then you have this epiphany about entrepreneurship and you want to help these entrepreneurs and guide them in, in building bigger businesses. So what is Profit Architects? Like what, where did it come from and what do you guys do today and uh, how do you like it? Yeah. So um, it, you know, it stems from that story I told about, you know, the, the rut that I see most entrepreneurs get into where it's all about growth and, and they're, you know, they're, the business is running them. Um, and so I work with six and seven figure businesses um, with the focus on creating more profit. Now, there's a lot of people who have an issue with profit, meaning they have like mental, you know, trash and mental blocks around, you know, profit. There's a lot of people who went into business to serve and help others. So um, the first thing is get your head around the fact that profits are not a bad thing. Uh, you know, when I, when we talk about profits, it's not only talking about putting money in your pocket. It could be, you know, taking those profits and reinvesting them in the business in a smart way way to help you scale and create the entrepreneurial dream lifestyle that you wanted to have yeah. when you started a business. Um, so, you know, that's the first step is sort of a mind shift, set shift. Um, I actually have an exercise on my website that you can download called uh, find your profit. Why? And it's along the lines of like Simon Sinek and, and know your why yeah. is critically important. And I kind of take it a step further and say, all right, let's start talking about your profit. Why, you know, okay. Imagine you had all this profit. What are you going to do with it? You know, do you want to finally take that fancy vacation? That's fine. You know, knock yourself out. You want yeah. to just 
stick it in your pocket and and put it in crypto. Whatever you want to do with it is fine, um, you know, or or use those profits. But the the point is that nothing happens, certainly not ever, the sale of your business uh, without profits, um, and it's difficult yeah. to grow without profits. Usually, if you don't have enough profit, you end up being leveraged and you're borrowing money to you know to, to help scale your growth, and it, it's just you know it, it's a mess. So um, what I do with with um, my clients uh, there is is I'll sit down, we do a deep dive, we look at like forty some areas of the business, and we go through this list of forty items and say, okay, are you doing this? No, okay, add it to the list. Are you doing this? No, add it to the list. Or, or I'm sorry, if it, are you doing this? Um, yes, but not well. Add it to the list. Are you doing this? Yes, okay, we don't need that on the list. So and what you end up hoping at the end of that deep dive is to come up with eight or 12 items that you can either start doing or improve drastically. And then you rank those items based on lowest, least cost and effort, highest impact, profit impact that goes on the top of the list. And then you just work the way down and then put a timeline to that list. And it becomes literally a coaching blueprint that you use to help the entrepreneur scale. Oh, that's awesome. And what are some of these items on this list? Would it be like sales, marketing, hiring, yeah, I, or is I, it like kind of like it, different it covers everything. So we look at costs, we look at processes, um, okay, and, and those kinds of things. But I'd say, you know, 70% of it is geared around sales and marketing. Um, yeah. You know, just do you have, you know, a, a funnel in place and, a you know, follow up, you know, protocols with your clients and reactivation protocols and, you know, that kind of stuff. We look at pricing and we look at the sales, um, uh, the sales system, the sales people, uh, because one of the things, um, and and I also do this as kind of an offshoot uh, is I I work, uh, the past couple of years, I've worked with over a hundred speakers, coaches, and consultants on helping them improve their sales uh, process and and sales uh, one-on-one calls because a lot of those people are experts in some field and they have no sales training, no interest in being good at sales, but they also aren't very good at it and and are fearful (laughs) of it. And, And in that industry too, where it's all mostly online uh, marketing and and uh, your process is all yeah. online. Uh, you know, everybody's really good at measuring the statistics, you know, at the top and middle of the funnel, meaning they know how many visits they got. They know how many clicks they got. They know how many opt-ins they got, you know, percentages. They know all these off yeah. the top of their head, right? But when you ask them, well, okay, you get in front of 10 people on the, on a sales call at the end of the whole thing, what's your, you know, how many of those do you convert? And they're like, well, I don't know, you know, maybe four or five. <clears throat> yeah. they, nobody pays attention to that. So I call it what's leaking out of your funnel. So yeah. that's, you know, that, that's an, another important area to look at uh, with businesses is a lot of businesses kind of feel like, okay, well, you know, our sales results is, is what we get at the end. It's the best our salespeople can do. Um, so they go start going back and let, well, let's <laughs> tweak our marketing. Let's, uh, and, and in fact, you know, their sales could be drastically improved. So anyway, th- those so are some... yeah. So you're, you're essentially saying that a good amount of the time, everything, like everything can be improved upon, of course, but we also have to shine the spotlight on ourselves and saying, are you actually converting? Are your salespeople actually converting? Can they improve and go from a one to a seven? And maybe you're bringing in two times more people. So then it doesn't, uh, you know what I mean? Right. And that's what you're referring to. And that, you know, depending on your cost of goods, that's a very, very high margin, sometimes a hundred percent right to profit, right to the bottom line. Yeah because you've already spent all the time, money, and effort to get them Train finally them, yeah. in front of you to, in this you know, final sales process. Uh, and if you lose them there, you know, that's where you're just kicking money out the door. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's interesting. And ha- how's that been going for you? <laughs> it's good. Um, yeah, I have. Uh, so, so with the um, six seven figure businesses, I've got a program called the hundred thousand dollar profit program, 
where we guarantee a hundred thousand dollars in profits above and beyond the fees. Uh, oh wow! We charge uh, for the coaching. Um, obviously, I have to be very selective about what businesses of get course. in there. And the hundred thousand, I mean, it, it's a marketing hook, um, and, and you know, and and I recognize that, and that's fine. Like, I'll, I'll, it's funny because I'll have some people say like a hundred thousand, like I can make that on one project. That's nothing. Um, and, and then to other people, it's like, oh my God, if I could have a hundred thousand. Um, so the point is, it's, you know, we're not trying to just hit that one number and leave. Um, you know, if you, ha- if your company has the capability to produce, you know, a half a million in new profits, then we're going to work toward that. Um, but the point is that, you know, we guarantee the hundred thousand or, or we just keep working and, until we hit that number, you know, and, and this is something I, you know, advise anybody thinking about becoming a business coach, a business advisor. It, you've got to have the stones, but uh, and the experience. But you know, put your money where your mouth is. Um, you know, like in my so so even if somebody doesn't, you know, I'm not willing to take them on in that hundred thousand dollar profit program. And I but I want to coach them, work with them. I will still offer a break even profit, break even guarantee, not revenue. But like, look, okay, you work with me for three months or six months. If if you don't feel like you've at least gotten this much and what you paid me in profits out of the relationship, then we'll keep working together until you do. Because it does me and my business no good to work with somebody for three or six months or a year and have them not be happy. Yeah, because someone who's upset about the experience could be the worst uh, customer. <laughs> yeah, It could lead down to, because the reputation we know is one of the right. most pretty often things. And someone in that experience who ends up happy is likely to refer to other people, you know, for you to work with. So, yeah. Absolutely. And um, how would you go about the referral part for people looking to get referrals? Would you just say, hey, like our time's up? Like, do you know anyone else? Or what would be the approach there? So, um, you know, obviously the best way, way way and when to ask for referrals is after a lengthy engagement where somebody knows and trusts you at that point. And it's a very natural process. Hey, can you help me out? Yeah. <clears throat> when someone doesn't know you that well and trust you at that point, then it's always good to offer some kind of an incentive. <laughs> um, so, you know, for instance, for for those people that that I don't know well, but like the idea of what I do and, and, and you know, know me enough to, to recommend yeah. Um, you know, I offer basically it's a referral commission, or yeah. whatever you call it, an affiliate fee of, um, yeah. you know, it's typically one month of whatever I engage with the client and, you know, I will give to somebody after they've been there 90 days, um, yeah. I'll, I'll, you know, send and say, Hey, you know, thank you very much for the referral. Here's a little something to say. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Just curious. Um, and then let's dive into glow. What is Glow? How'd you get involved with Glow? Why Glow? So if you've ever heard of EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization, or YPO, Young Presidents Organization, there's uh, Women Presidents Organization. So um, I was involved in EO uh, here in Pittsburgh for um, about 15 years. I was on the board for a decade. I was president twice. And um, uh, and, and that's, you know, some of these stories I told about the peer groups and, and the yeah. entrepreneur network that I had built was, was all, you know, by being involved with EO. So Glow was founded by a woman who was also involved in EO and based out of Dallas. I had gotten to know her, you know, a long time ago from attending conferences and in international universities with, with the Entrepreneurs Organization. She was also uh, on the board internationally of YPO. And so she founded GLOW, uh, which is Global Leaders Organization, and we've modeled it exactly after EO, YPO, WPO. So we do everything that those organizations do, but we have some additional components that we add on to that. And we also have um, a a couple other differentiators. Um, One is uh, that our price point is significantly less than the other organizations. And that's intentional because we want to be more inclusive and, and we're on a mission to build a network of a million entrepreneurs globally uh, over the next five years. And the other is that we have global partners 
like Microsoft, Deloitte, and some very big business names uh, on our advisory board and board uh, to help grow this thing, um, you know, like we know it can. So um, I got involved with Glow initially just to start a chapter in Pittsburgh, uh, similar to, you know, what I had done years back yeah. with, with EO. Um, and then uh, it, it, as I got more involved with the organization, um, they asked me to step up and, and be the EVP for chapter chair. So um, now my job with Glow is to find, uh, recruit, and onboard uh, and oversee chapter chairs to start chapters all over the world. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. So, and how, how, yeah, you keep going. Well, I was just going to say, so, you know, I, I the, the whole reinvention piece and the epiphany hanging out with helping entrepreneurs every day. You know, I, I hung the shingle with the profit architects. Okay, I'm back in the business coaching game. Um, and then when Glow happened and, and just the way it happened organically, when, when you know, I stepped into that position of, of doing the global chair thing, um, it was, it, it had come full circle. So literally now I, I am, you know, paid to hang out with and help entrepreneurs every day. Wow. And how did you, um, for you, how, how did you feel like you were receptive and open to these opportunities? Because obviously, um, previous, like earlier in the podcast, you talked about how you were closed off during that uh, time. How do you think you opened up? And were because obviously the global chair, that's a huge role. That's not a, like, even taking on a chapter of a, area is a big role so to be really open and receptive to those new opportunities because i know people get opportunities here and there and they're like no maybe yes and they fumble around with it and they can't make a decision so what is it that allowed you to really make the decision and made you receptive to it i mean i think it comes back to you know what's your core beliefs and and you know it took me a long time to, I mean, I kind of knew this early on, but then I got completely away from it. And when I came back to this idea that I, I need to find a way just to hang out and help entrepreneurs, um, you know, I, then I think the universe opened to me and, and that sounds a little woo, but, um, you, you know, these opportunities, you know, develop themselves. I mean, you know, I, Obviously, there's some component at which I earned these opportunities, uh, you know, just based on showing up and, and being authentic and, and, and being real and, and knowing, you know, having some background and experience. But um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, opportunities will present themselves, you know, like you're saying, if, if you're open to it, but you've got to be more than open to it. You've got to, you know, have the credentials to step into an opportunity and, and make it work because there are certainly opportunities that have come along that I'll look at and go, you know what, that's just not me. That's not my fit. Um, yeah. But for me, Glow is a perfect fit. Um, I love the organization. I love the mission. Uh, and we do, you know, we do some pretty incredible things. Like we have our own capital network. Uh, so we have a, a network of 800 to 1,000 investors looking to work with entrepreneurs on a debt or equity basis. Uh, we provide education around getting uh, fund ready or raise ready. Uh, for uh, capital, and that's it's that that's a that's one thing that's a hard sell for entrepreneurs because no entrepreneur thinks they need to raise money until they need to raise money. Um, the, you know, there's not many entrepreneurs with the foresight to go. You know what? I might need to raise money someday, so let me let me put things in place now as I'm growing my business that are going to make it a lot easier for me to raise money should the need ever arise very few entrepreneurs get to that place. Um, you know, most are behind the eight ball at a point when it's like, oh my God, my world's crashing. I need to borrow money. I need to find investors. Or, um, so we help with that process. We have a, a member marketplace where we, you know, encourage uh, members to do business with each other globally. Um, and, and it's just starting up. Uh, where, you know, Glow started right before COVID. Uh, part of that whole mission, like in a chapter, what we do is we have monthly chapter uh, events for entrepreneurs. And again, these are not like your BNI pitch fest type networking events. Uh, we bring in very high level business speakers for these events uh, and you make meaningful connections with other local entrepreneurs. And then we form these peer groups uh, within uh, GLOW, the groups of nine to 10 uh, entrepreneurs get together every month. 
Um, so there's there's lots of components to it uh, that you you know, uh, and, and for chairs, I'll, I'll put a plug in here since so so right now we have, uh, I think 13 chapters, uh, two in Canada, one in Mexico, and the rest are scattered around the US. So lots of major markets out there uh, in the US and all over the world. Uh, if you have an interest in becoming a chapter chair. The chapter chair position is an unbelievable way to immediately elevate yourself to the top of the local or regional entrepreneurial community. You position yourself as a chapter chair with GLOW and, it, and you're going to immediately get credibility, respect, and, and networking opportunities that you wouldn't otherwise um, in your local community. So if you have a type of business that you know, would be elevated by stepping into that kind of role, then the chair position could be perfect for you. There is compensation for the chair position. Uh, I like to say no one's going to get rich being a, a, a GLOW chair, but at least, you know, like I spent a decade on the board of EO and never got a dime for it. Um, yeah. so at least with GLOW, you know, there's some, the, the room funds room, coming through. Yeah, yeah there, there's funds coming through that then help can help you reinvest and build your chapter or you can put it in pocket but um yeah so it's it's yeah, a great opportunity I, absolutely and i think it's incredible what you were doing because i didn't know what you were doing for early entrepreneurs and where they're trying to raise funds and everybody i talk to everybody i hear you need more money and it takes longer <laughs> so it's better to get started early yeah yeah absolutely um but yeah, and, and so uh, our criteria is significantly lower to, to be a member of GLOW is significantly lower than most of the other O organizations. Um, so for GLOW, you have, have to either be uh, an owner with 500,000 revenue or three employees, or you can be a hired C-suite leader if you have a million dollar plus P&L responsibility. So you don't have to be an owner if you've got P&L responsibility. Yeah. You know above that but very that's, cool that's who glow's designed for incredible i think it's going to be awesome uh jay where can people reach you where, where can they hear about profit architect where can they find out more about glow so uh the profitarchitects.com is my okay. business website the glow website is with glow.com but that's with glo.com no w and then I'm really easy to find uh, on places like LinkedIn with my name, uh, or you can just email me, jay at fairbrother.com. Awesome. I appreciate the time, and this has been an incredible story. Thank you for sharing. Sure, anytime.